thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, these Eco Church Corridor happen every couple of months on a Monday evening, and uh, they, um, the topic for this evening is the big picture on plastics. The uh, global treaty, indeed, uh, and uh, we are. Um, there's been a team of us organising tonight, so I'd like to um, uh, greet Megan uh, Blackie here in Christchurch with me. Hi, Megan. Hi, everyone. Come out of me. And um, and Karen, Karen Weir, where are you, Karen? Uh, and we're um, hosted by um, Iris uh, Lee, who's the uh, Russia administrator, and um, my name is Sylvia Purdy. I'm just one of the team. Uh, tēnā pato katoa. Welcome. Haere mai. Haere mai ki te, ki te hui nei, uh, i te, uh, te pō nei. Uh, I am um, currently on the um, Burnham Army Base uh, out of Christchurch. Uh, where I've been involved uh, over the last um, two or three years uh, with Arosha and Christchurch, and part of that has been coordinating a Zero Waste for Churches program. Uh, I never really expected to be uh, dealing with rubbish issues. I, I always used to think that that was someone else's uh, problem, preferably my husband, actually. <laughs> terribly sexist I do apologize uh, but this whole um, process uh, going uh, right back to um, 2019 where I went to uh, our director Crystal's place and, and, and knuckled down for a few weeks writing a bible study about waste asking this question of what might the bible have to say about rubbish uh, and here we're looking at one specific but hugely problematic aspect of our global waste problem and that is plastic uh, and plastic is such wonderful stuff and yet it has just been so terrible for our planet and is now just covering the surface of the planet with our plastic so it is marvelous to hear that there is uh, some collective effort going on at the highest levels of our global politics and we look forward to hearing about that and particularly how we and our local churches and situations uh, might be able to support this Ngā mihi, ngā mihi koutou, uh, ngā mihi uh, ki tō tātou atua, tō tātou ariki, ko ihukaraiti, uh, me te wairua tapu. Blessings on our evening tonight. I would like to hand over to Megan to uh, open us in a karakia. Well, we are uh, drawing from various faith communities and also we're leaving behind the uh, perhaps the stresses or the doings of the day. So I just thought we'd start with a contemplation. So I just um, take a moment to settle into your chair, to take in a deep breath in and out, in and out. You may wish to close your eyes for a moment and tune in to the animating force of the universe that many of us refer to as God. Let us become aware of this creative, loving being who offers us inspiration positivity and hope, and feeds our desire for action. During this time spent together, may we listen in with more than our ears and our minds, aware of the stirrings of our hearts. And we ask for the courage to act on these to transform the hurts of the world. You can open your eyes if you wish. I find it encouraging that the United Nations itself acknowledges the impact that faith has on people's decision-making and our actions. Their Faith for Earth initiative set up five years ago is designed to encourage, empower, and engage 
with faith-based organisations as partners at all levels toward achieving the sustainable development goals. Basically, they welcome us to be involved. Arosha too acknowledges that faith and earth care and environmental, environmental justice are all interwoven. Encouragingly, Arosha Aotearoa New Zealand is one of a number of no, local NGOs receiving updates from the Ministry for the Environment about its policy work on plastics, more specifically work on the Plastics Treaty. So as faith-based people and groups, we can connect and build relationship and influence and make an impact. Cool way. <laughs> so I hand it back to Sylvia. Beautiful, that's lovely to just pause. It's so important. Um, the, if you're on this call, you're no doubt part of our Eco Church network. And if you're not yet on our um, general mailing list and Facebook and all of that, then um, please do uh, go to our Eco Church website and sign up. Uh, we value your participation in our Eco Church, which is a project of our Rosha. Aotearoa New Zealand, which is, uh, as Megan mentioned, part of um, a global movement of Christians caring about creation. Um, I mentioned some of the work that we've done. Uh, it's often I find as um, I start to talk to people about the environment and how it connects with uh, faith, uh, waste tends to be the, one of the first things that people think of. And one of the first things they think about waste is what to do with a plastic bottle or all the other, just the incredible myriad of um, items from uh, one of these to, uh, to these things here, cables, to uh, random bits of fabric, to oh, what else have I got on my desk? I've got some uh, packaging material with bubble wrap. It's just that we are surrounded by plastic. Uh, and it's kind of easy for us in uh, our nice middle class homes. We ha I have a yellow bin out the front, uh, we're at the back, which will take it all away. Uh, and most people on the planet don't have yellow bins out the back that the council takes away. Uh, most people on the planet are um, have other people's rubbish dumped on them and live literally surrounded by plastic. Uh, so we can be ourselves immune, but it's part of our calling from um, Christ to care for our neighbor, uh, that we care for uh, our neighbors who live in any country on the planet, the, the poorest, who are most impacted. Not to mention, of course, the whales, the birds, the seabirds, the fish. Um, I would... Uh, Draw your attention to the Eco Church website. Uh, we have a lovely page there about waste. Uh, we're thinking we might add a page specific about, about plastics. And uh, Megan's done some wonderful research with lots of uh, really interesting websites and things for you to follow up. Uh, and we will email that to you afterwards. That's all from me. Okay, well, let's move into some Q&A. So, Tricia, if you would like to unmute yourself, um, and people may like to go to speak of you if they want to. So, um, a very, very warm welcome to Dr. Tricia Farrelly, who I think is a superstar in the past <laughs> advocacy sphere. Uh, she's an associate professor at Massey University in the School of People, Environment and Planning, which is part of Social Sciences. She's co-founder of the Aotearoa Plastic Pollution Alliance and the New Zealand Product Stewardship Council. And I'm impressed that she's a finalist in the 2021 <laughs> Women of Influence Award. Yeah, go for it. Um, and the member of the Advisory Committee on Plastics for the UN Environment Programme. So, Pumarie, and welcome. Kia ora, Koto, and thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that lovely welcome, Megan and Sylvia. Um, 
So for those not up to speed with the plastics treaty mandate, it was signed in March and 175 nations signed this historic document. So I thought perhaps we'd just go from global to perhaps more local activities. So shall we kick off by, I'll ask you, what can you tell us about the UN Global Plastics Treaty mandate and why is it necessary and what are its goals? Okay, so with the, this this um, resolution or mandate for a legally binding global plastics pollution treaty, um, which is aptly titled Ending Plastic Pollution, it's a very aspirational, ambitious, I think it's a wonderful title. Um, this started way back in uh, 2014. Um, there's a series of international um, meetings through the United Nations, um, five in fact, and um, the first again was around 20, sort of 13, 2014. I joined in 2017. Um, and it's been very interesting because uh, it's been an awfully long road. Um, and the language has changed dramatically since 2017 up to the point where we are now, where we actually have a mandate for a, a global treaty. One of the things that I would just say is I sort of tell the story of how we got to where we are now is that um, I was part of a global civil society um, major group uh, of the of the United Nations at the time, uh, and when our our kind of um, our goal at each of these international meetings was to talk to uh, national focal points or ministry representatives from various countries. Um, I took on kind of a regional, uh, I was the regional kind of focal point for the Pacific Islands and for Aotearoa at the time. Um, and every time we would mention that we were fighting for a treaty, um, we were pretty much ridiculed. It was, it was laughed off at that time in 2017. It was just seen to be overly ambitious um, and it was, a, it was a pipe dream and that um, whilst they, the people we spoke to were keen for something to be done, that was just beyond our reach. Um, so I have to say that when the treaty was passed earlier this year, um, because of COVID, I was unable to go travel to Nairobi this time to be there. I was sitting in here in this very office um, at three o'clock in the morning because of the horrible time zones. And we're at the short, you always get the short end of the stick in ter terms of time zones when we're dealing with Northern Hemisphere meetings. A lot of those global meetings are all Northern Hemisphere. Um, and when they passed the mandate and um, I could see a standing ovation and loud shouts of joy from the room at United Nations, which you never see when a resolution is passed. You just don't, it's never been seen before. I just burst into tears. It was just like years of everybody's hard mahi to try to get to where we got to. And we just couldn't believe it, even though that's what we've been fighting for because of the, of, of such a different sort of change in climate and, and the narrative and the discourse since 2017 to 2022 is just phenomenal. So we were talking in 2017, we were sort of stuck on, you know, dealing with marine litter, not, not all plastics in all environments, but marine litter. We weren't talking very much about microplastics. We were, we were stuck at the point where we were trying to deal with waste management rather than waste prevention. Um, so we'd come and such an incredibly long way since 20 since 2017 between 27 and 2022 it's been quite phenomenal and i would have to say just going back to your introduction megan that it is through church groups and generally civil society groups um that's the reason why we have a treaty mandate today it's not um sadly not because of um national interventions um, in isolation, it's the, the tremendous push um, from independent science and civil society that we are where we are today. Um, so that's just giving you a bit of background. Did you want me to, to talk now about a little bit about what's in the resolution, Megan? Yeah, that would be great. Um, so in, in the resolution, what we have is an ambitious title, um, which I think is a, a good start. Um, it's going to be a long road. This won't happen tomorrow, unfortunately, although many of us would really love dearly for that to happen. Um, we're looking at another five intergovernmental negotiating committee meetings. Essentially, there are five international meetings where the treaty text will be negotiated. 
The first of those meetings will be held in Uruguay at the end of um, November this year, uh, beginning of December. Um, the, the mandate for a treaty opens us up to talk about things like, you know, where, what do we want the aims uh, well, the objectives um, and the structure of work and things to be around this around this treaty. What do we want it to capture? What are the core concepts? You know, the, we, we all know that words are powerful. Um, we all know that words are powerful. And um, so ensuring that we have the right um, terms in, in the treaty um, is important, but also that we share the same definitions. There's a lot of words that are thrown around out there in the environmental space and the social um, justice, environmental justice space that are very wildly differently interpreted. And an example of that, of course, is sustainability. Um, but we, we're not even at the point yet where we all share the same definition of what plastics are uh, and therefore what needs to be captured in terms of plastics uh, within the treaty text. And that's going to be something that will be hotly debated right um mostly at the first meeting in november this year because we're going to be trying to nail down some of those definitions and, and the core concepts mm. um so it invites us there's a possibility for us to focus on what they've described as a full life cycle of plastics but of course definitions around that are important too um plastics industry would lo love for that to be captured only from um say for example production of plastic products to um you know waste management whereas those of us with a more ambitious target would love to see um the life cycle of plastics and in fact i don't believe life cycle is an appropriate term because there's nothing circular restorative regenerative about plastics so my preference is for full life um, sort of spectrum or um, what was the term I've just used recently? Um, oh, it's gone out of my head now, but sort of life phases or stages rather than cycles. Um, and I'd see, I'd like to see that from pre, uh, pre extraction. So prospecting for extraction of fossil fuels, which is 99% of the feedstocks used in plastics today, right through to post management, say, for example, where landfills fail, or where incinerator plants fail. Um, and of course, including the emissions and leakage of plastics all the way through all of those phases. Um, so th those sorts of things will be discussed. There's plenty of opportunity, which is exciting to talk about production, sustainable production and consumption, which we're hoping um, will really focus strongly on um, not only product design, but also polymer design. So for toxic free, safe design of only a narrow range of necessary polymers yeah. um, that can be recyclable, that can be reusable primarily, um, and so forth, not just products. So there's a lot of other things beside, but there's lots of scope and they'll take a lot of work for us to really nail down, down um, what, what will be included in the text and around regulations and procedures and those sorts of things. Yeah, it sounds um, kind of confusing when you, you talk about plastic and, and the group of experts <laughs> are still debating actually what what can, constitutes plastic. So, you know, it, it, uh, it's hard then for general people to probably get their head around and I think perhaps later on we might you know to look at that sort of the whole issue of bioplastics and what you know what sort of plastics are okay um so I just wondered moving on to New Zealand's role sort of what why how is New Zealand in, involved in this process and what specifically is your role in all of this so New Zealand's been involved because, of course, they've had their delegates attend all of these meetings all the way through, right from the beginning, from the United Nations Environment Assembly number one, um, the, you know, the start of discussions around the resolution, um, or the possibilities of a resolution for a treaty. Um, and New Zealand has always, quite frankly, taken a rather back seat, um, always waiting for other countries to make the move first, particularly their allies. Um, trading partners and so on, as you can imagine, um, and then making a kind of decision at the 11th hour. Um, that's really kind of been their modus operandi. That's kind of how they've operated. Um, I, I think I think recently they have, uh, and this is the same, I think, for many other 
uh, national focal points or government you know, delegates attending these meetings and negotiating in these spaces. As soon as we got a mandate for a treaty, they all woke up and they started investing their time and their attention towards this, ensuring that they have people with boots on the ground in Uruguay, for example. Um, Australia, for example, has phenomenally um, funded uh, all the countries or one, one delegate per country across Pacific Islands to attend in person. It's a lot of money and investment. Um, now that's Australia, um, but that's an example of countries sort of waking up to the call uh, now that we have a mandate. The same has happened for Aotearoa, well, for New Zealand, for the government of New Zealand. Um, MFE, or the Ministry for the Environment and Ministry for Foreign Affairs and Trade have come together in ways that I haven't seen before around the treaty negotiations. Um, so I think they're kind of upping their game in that regard. I'm seeing emails coming to me with both MFE and MFAT um, emails on them. Um, my role in this, um, Primarily it had been, as I say, to support Pacific Island countries. My role now has sort of grown to support civil society groups across the Asia Pacific through the Break Free From Plastic movement. Um, Break Free From Plastic movement has over 1500 organizations across the globe. Um, and a large proportion of those comes from Asia Pacific considering it's, it's, it's one of the largest regions. Um, but for New Zealand, um, they've very, again, at the last minute, um, finally um, started coming to the Aotearoa Plastic Pollution Alliance and the expertise that we have within that organisation, um, asking for um, advice and support and guidance in negotiating for the Plastics Treaty from an Aotearoa-specific perspective. Um, and that's really pleasing to see. Um, so I've got a very quick turnaround on trying to provide them some written feedback. <laughs> um, their timeframes are tight my time frame is very you know, timing is very un, unfree um so I, it's, it's been hard for me to find some time to do that but i'm hoping to meet with them um on next monday in uh in uh in, in Pornica in wellington uh to discuss that and to provide my feedback um but they'll be there they'll be on the ground and i'm hoping that, that with more nudging from groups like this um they will be making interventions national statements and so on that are located that locate the, the the text of the interventions way at the top of the waste hierarchy um, to ensure that environmental justice is forefront in their minds as they make those interventions um, that they're working again at prevention rather than sort of dallying around at the waste management phase where it's just too late because the production increases and that just increases volumes for further waste management um, and that they are focused on um, detoxifying the economy, um, circular economy, circular economy for plastics for the question mark, but circular economy and adding plastics in where absolutely necessary only, but certainly only when that is safe, toxic free and just. Um, particularly, and I just want to draw attention back to what Sylvia was saying there before too, around marginal communities. I've just come back from India. Um, spent two days with waste pickers. And so just transition around this will also be extraordinarily important to ensure that those who whose lives depend on um, collecting plastics and other waste um, are justly transitioned to a safer, toxic free livelihood, uh, and they don't lose jobs overnight is important as well. Wow, it just shows the interconnectedness of this whole industry, isn't it? The ripple effect right across a number of different issues. Um, it's not all bad news, though, and I think um, we need to celebrate, you know, some of the initiatives in New Zealand. Do you want to talk a bit about the National Plastics Action Plan and some of the successes? Yeah, we're making some headway there. Perhaps I, I come from probably a slightly more critical view. I'm, I'm seeing changes. I'm excited about that. Um, there are definitely some snags that we need to kind of watch out for. Um, I, I guess a little bit of the cynicism comes out of my work with the National Container Deposit Scheme Working Group, and we had developed a very, what I thought was a really diplomatic work, work program over a couple of years to develop a really fine container deposit scheme um, for Aotearoa. Um, that unfortunately has been hijacked by the plastics industry. Um, and so the package, plastics packaging has now taken leadership over uh, the, that, that work stream. Um, we've just written a letter to the ministry and various ministers um, 
declaring our, our concern uh, with, with that process. We feel it's a little bit like, you know, the, the fox in the hen house. Um, so um, it's great, however, to see that finally New Zealand is, is working towards a container deposit scheme. So that's terrific. Um, there's work around um, uh, greater separation, uh, better and more effective, efficient separation of waste at curbside, which is terrific. There's work around um, reducing food waste in commercial enterprises, which is also terrific. Um, we're seeing the la we've seen the landfill levy, which is good, which is great too. Um, there's a number of work streams, particularly around priority products through the waste minimisation act 2008 that are taking place one of those is the container deposit scheme um, another one is around tires i understand there's there's thing there's work around um, agri-plastics which is an important space too but again with the agri-plastics it's also another working group that is um, led by the plastics industry so we really have to be very careful about um, ensuring that there is a level of um, independence in the way that these programs are run once they once they kind of spin out design might be one thing but um, independent management of those schemes I think will be really important. Okay and so just to get a bit more practical how can we each of us contribute in our faith communities to the work that's being done? What, um, what does the treaty offer us to in terms of getting engaged with? Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good question. I mean, there's a number. I mean, in this in this age of COVID, um, and here we are all here together on screen. There's lots of um, webinars and seminars um, uh, that that um, are based around the treaty process. That um, some are more accessible than others in terms of the content. So there are some wonderful civil society groups out there who um, who are offering these webinars to uh, to encourage civil society groups to get involved and how they might get involved. Um, unfortunately, again, some of those in the Northern Hemisphere, you might be finding yourself either asking for recordings or attending at 2.30 in the morning, which is the case for the next one coming up. We don't want you to do that, not too often anyway. Um, but certainly the Aotearoa Plastic Pollution Alliance, New Zealand Product Stewardship Council, Zero Waste Network Aotearoa. I mean, there's lots of wonderful, wonderful zero waste groups here who um, uh, would be would would be very keen to talk about that in an entire seminar. But just off the top of my head, how can you, um, in, as an organisation, um, get involved in that space? And I, I feel everybody can and, and should if they if they're able to and if they you know if they're willing to. Um, for me, it's around um, you know writing letters to ministers. Um, just as we did again today around the container deposit scheme and our concerns around that, writing letters to the editor, um, you know, getting your voice out there through social media. Um, just there's there's information online about the treaty through the UNEP, United Nations Environment Programme or UNEP INC, and that's the Inter Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee. It's a whole white website um, that's dedicated to, you know, all the information is publicly available, what's in the agenda, submissions from countries, submissions from civil society, I think are the most accessible ones for us because they're written in a pretty clear language. Um, there's um, items like glossaries, you know, we talked about def definitions. Well, the United Nations Environment Programme has submitted its own definitions. Now they're not definitive, but they're suggestions. And we might look at those and think to ourselves, oh, are they really ambitious enough or not? And then we might respond to those and write to the government, New Zealand government, and say, I've seen this glossary on the UNEP INC website, and actually I think plastics should include bioplastics, or they should include some of those weird, you know, kind of um, water-soluble, you know, gel plastics and things like that as well. Um, what you might find in nappies and sanitary products, for example. Um, or you might say, look, you know, I can see these definitions for full life cycle of plastics. Uh, and actually, I'm more comfortable with um, going, being more ambitious than that and capturing plastics further up the waste stream before they become problematic. And we know that there are human rights issues right from extraction right through to the end. So um, I would, you know, that's one simple way uh, that you can get involved in that space. Or just simply writing a letter, a simple letter to say, great to see that MFAT and MFE are going to be attending these meetings. We're really excited about the prospect of a really ambitious and comprehensive plastic pollution treaty that's legally binding. We encourage you to be as ambitious as possible and to work towards prevention, 
knowing what we know about the impacts of plastic uh, in our you know, across our motu. So mm. anything like that would be really, really helpful. Well, that seems pretty um, easy for most of us, I think, to be able to put pen to paper or type something. Um, so just getting back to it, the definition, the hard, the, you know, how, what are we talking about then when you mention, co you know, compostable, biodegradable, what, what is it that we're really tackling? What's, what's the, the, the definition of plastic that you are working with? Um, there's a number of different documents that are in, pro, in, um, in re, under review at the moment. So one of them is with the Centre for International Environmental Law based in Geneva that I, I work with regularly. And another one with the uh, Global Alliance for Incineration Alternatives or Gaia. Um, also, they work with um, as, uh, to, and of course, the UNEP has presented their own. It's on the website, the UNEP INC website. Um, you see definitions in two different documents. One of them is in the glossary and the other one is in a document called um, Plastic Science. And that's where it defines what it sort of feels is the best definition for plastics. Um, there's a number of, a couple of glossaries from Germany through a submission, country submission. There's various things floating around. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm currently working with CL and Gaia on their definitions to make sure we have science the best, most robust science-based evidence supporting a clear definition. Um, the definitions also need to be legal definitions because of course this is for an environmental law, a global treaty. Um, and so it has to be um, couched in legalese. It has to be, it can't be uh, indeterminate language. It has to be clear and concrete and precise not at all in the way that a social scientist or even by the way a biophysical scientist might be very careful about their language choices um, so so defining for example what plastics are um, will be have to be comprehensive it will be well supported um, and it won't leave any space for questions or loopholes for um, misinterpretation or for hijacking from those with different interests let's, let's just say so what, is it likely that there'll be a reduction in certain types of plastics being m manufactured? That's the hope, Megan. Yeah, so there's two different ways of looking at this. And again, there's, so, well, there's actually more than two ways of looking at it because we, one of the definitions that need to be made clear in full life cycle or in, um, you know, in the definition of plastics or the definition of plastics pollution and all of those things is that plastics isn't simply a physical material it's made of, of of physical and chemical properties and the majority of those chemicals are toxic um they've got endocrine disrupting chemicals in them they've made with fillers and additives and all sorts of things so um and many of those um are considered to be um, substances of concern um, under the Stockholm, Stockholm Convention and, and, and Sycam, I think it is as well, P POPs under uh, Stockholm Convention or Persistent Organic Pollutions. So we have to be very clear that these um, there's the pre-production pellets or the noodles we might see on the beaches and all around the country. Um, they also flakes um, and there's powders. So they come in many pre-production forms. That's what those things are, are used to make plastic products. Um, and then there's the plastic products themselves, which again also incorporates a, a wide range of intentional chemicals. And then there's a non-intentional toxicants or substances that occur even through the production of plastics through, for example, the application of heat um, through um, through the management of plastics, through recycling, the latest research has found that the uh, recycled plastics have a higher amount of toxicants in them wow. than the virgin plastic themselves, which raises huge questions for pushing for higher content, recycled content, for example, in our you know, beverage bottles and our food containers. So there's there's a range of things to consider when we when we're seeking to um, employ the full range of you know what it means to be plastic, but also what happens to plastic to create plastic pollution and its 
broader sense. I'm, mm. I've forgotten what your question is because I've gone off on a tangent now. No, so I've answered your question. I mean, and what's coming to mind, I want to ground it in some experience. Like I just went looking for underwear. Now, you you know, it's very hard to find cotton or, some, you know, it's a lot of it synthetic. So, I mean, how, how what will the world look like with this treaty? Will right. it mean that there won't be polyester, you know, clothing or whatever? What's it going to What's the world That's right. going to look like? Okay. That's your question that I moved away from so quickly. I'm so sorry. Um, so one of the things that they're also working towards is, is capping virgin plastics. That's, mm. that's going to make the huge difference, I think, capping virgin plastics. Um, and so, yes, what do we do if we cap virgin plastics and we're looking at de detoxifying the, 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 the economy? Um, um, so there are a whole bunch of different textiles for example if we're, we're talking about textiles that that could be swapped out as safe safer more sustainable alternatives to synthetic polymers uh, for textiles which is the majority of our clothing today let's face it particularly with fast fashion um, however they're the they're cost prohibitive um, and we also have to be very careful of where we source the you know where we source the, the products necessary to, to create um, garments from organic um, textiles, for example. So if we were, for example, to think of um, harakeke, that, that might be fine, um, but do we have the right to take the harakeke from a particular place? Do we have the right to produce, to manufacture, to take the, that product? Where does it come from? Do we have enough? Um, I, I just, I mean, that's a, that's a local example to, I think we need to think very carefully about. Um, Certainly, I think wool is, is fantastic, great example. Maybe possums we should be thinking more carefully as, about as well. Um, but if I think about, let's say, here's a, here's a classic example of where we don't want to go. We don't want to be going down the bioplastics um, route whereby we use cornstarch for single-use plastic bags, for example. Why? Because cornstarch made from corn, monocropping for corn, dispossession of people and, dispos and, and um, displacement of edible food sources for single use products is not where we want to go. They use a lot of water, they use a lot of pesticides, they use a lot of fertilizers in order to produce these single use products. That's not what we want. And often we, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of talk about alternatives and substitutes and they often fall into the single use category, which is highly problematic. The other thing, of course, too, is that, that even those cornstarch bags, all of the bioplastics, my colleagues, and I'm not a biochemist, but my colleagues have tested, all have endocrine disrupting chemicals in them. So um, there's, and we don't know this because there's no labeling, so it's very hard to check. <laughs> a lot of that is done through IP, you know, intellectual property rights, can't get the information. So, um, so labeling is going to be important, but going back to your question, Megan, I, there has to be a, a massive ecosystem change in order to support the kinds of safe, toxic free alternatives that we need. But also there's green chemistry, which is actually very exciting. We have a New Zealand colleague of, of mine, Terry, Terry Collins, who works at Carnegie Mellon now and he is a very big advocate for green chemistry and it is adamant that he can remove all endocrine disrupting chemicals from plastics um, but of course funding will be an issue um, nobody want the petrochemical industry will not want to fund his research um, you know most most countries won't want to fund that because it detracts from the big money that's tied up in big oil big petrochem and big plastics mm -hmm. Because mm. that was one thing I was thinking of, you know, the industry isn't going to, the plastics industry isn't necessarily just going to, you know, roll over, is it? So, I mean, they, the, the stats I read of, you know, they're ramping up and millions of dollars of, you know, and, they, and they've got an exponential growth curve, you know, as is, is in future. So how do we, how do we tackle that Um is it in our purchasing power, the decisions we make as communities? I mean, I'm sure lots of churches have looked at, you know, how, how do we buy um, more sustainable and um, yeah, ecologically friendly um, product? Yeah, yeah, well, you're absolutely right. And the production of plastics have quadrupled over the last 40 years. 
and they're set to triple by 2060. So this is not slowing down. Regardless of all of the voluntary measures and the promises made by industry, the recycling industry trying to ramp up but not being supported. Um, so absolutely, that's right. That's, that's what's happening. So, um, so essentially what's needed is a plastic pollution treaty because that's the global cooperation needed to regulate at production. It, it, you know, the producers of plastics don't come from New Zealand. We don't, we don't produce petrochemicals and, um, and the additives and, and the, the polymers necessary to produce plastics. We do, we do import those pre-production pallets, flakes and, and you know, so on. But we don't, um, we don't actually make a whole lot of plastics here. In fact, majority of the products are from recycled products and, but it's not a very big industry. Um, so, so, uh, you know, global cooperation to ensure the biggest polluters are regulated heavily at source is what we're seeking. Um, however, still, like you say, you know, bottom up, top down, um, and it's civil society that's pushed this and we can need to continue to push right from the local level. So what can we do? Um, we can support, for example, the amazing network of zero waste grocers across the country, zero waste retailers who are struggling. Why are they struggling? Because they have to internalize a lot of the costs that plastic producers don't internalize, packaging companies don't internalize. Um, you know, essentially plastic producers and other manufacturers and retailers are subsidized for the products that they distribute and sell because the plastic waste, we're talking about waste, rubbish, that comes as part and parcel of their profit making uh, is carried by us, by the, by the consumer, um, by our, you know, our recycling plants and our municipal, our councils, local councils, and the burden is heavy. Um, but the, re the, the zero wasters, those businesses who are zero waste, um, they're not otherwise subsidized to get their businesses off the ground, to, to build their networks, to build capacity, to build economies of scale. And that's where I think, that's what I think we should be doing. We should be supporting them either through our, you know, consumer choices, um, but again, also encouraging the government to subsidize and support them. You know, I, coming back from India, they were saying that in Asia Pacific, or that, you know, Southeast Asia, 99% of zero waste stores failed. And I, I can see why that is. And yet there is such a strong effort to do so because there's an ethic and a responsibility sitting behind that. Um, and I think we need to support that. Yeah, I, I agree. Well, well, there's a challenge for us all. And we're, we're, that sort of kind of segues us into the next section where each of us will have an uh, opportunity to think about ways that we can, um, you know, work towards this uh, toxic plastic free future. Um, we'll get into breakout groups in, in a minute, but just the lucky last question. Um, when we talked earlier, you, you shared this wonderful phrase that um, you talked about hope and that there's a, you felt a tsunami of incredible work happening. And I think sometimes we forget when we read the paper or online that, you know, there's a lot of negative, negativity, bad news stories. So can you just give some examples of what inspires you? What, what gets you up in the morning, you know? <laughs> oh, so many things get me up in the morning. Um, I, I, okay, so around plastics though, I, I am so fortunate to be surrounded by the most beautiful people working in this space. And Megan, you know some of them through the Aotearoa Plastic Pollution Alliance. Many of you might know, for example, Hannah Bloomhart and Liam Prince, who are, you know, um, who are also on the Aotearoa Plastic Pollution um, Alliance and the New Zealand Product Stewardship Council, and they tour around New Zealand teaching people and encouraging people to go zero waste. I mean, I mean, those are those are just two um, in Aotearoa, but um, I. I'm also lucky enough to work with um, large groups of, you know, scientists who work in microplastics in Aotearoa and and um, with the with the regional program for the Pacific and all the countries who are, who have written a declaration, signed a declaration um, to ensure that plastics no longer uh, pollute the islands and never come in and don't go out, as is the case today. I work with um, again the Break Free from Plastic movement, which is a, which is a massive 
massive number of just phenomenally energetic young <laughs> young enthusiasts more younger and more energetic than me i wish i was able to sort of do what they did they are so energetic and so enthusiastic and so passionate about the, the work that they do and thank goodness for them because again i think that's it's largely how we got to where we are the letter writing the campaigning the presentations the beach audits the you know the um the litter anti-litter campaigns which is kind of you know there's a, a small small part of it it's all about education and, and basically spreading the word um it's you know the protests in the street um the banners going up in photographs the laughter on you know the webinars that's what gets me up in the morning because um when i see these people who are again and then many of them are most touched by plastic pollution like i've got a colleague in louisiana cancer alley um, and her friends and Fano and, and colleagues die around her um, and they work in the petrochemical industry and if they don't they live right next door and they're breathing in all the pollutants from the petrochemical plastics industry um, i have colleagues and friends who you know the the drains block up every day during the rains and the rainy season and monsoons with plastics and people are you know dying from disease and waste pickers are you know are struggling in some places and less than others and so and those people rock up with smiles on their faces oh by the way someone from the ukraine joined our plastic pollution call the other day you know attending you know attending the treaty negotiations online it's so important to her I mean, it just blows my mind, seriously. So that's what gets me up in the morning. I've just so, so many amazing people out there, truly. Wonderful. Well, let's um, all join in and be part of the movement. Oh, thank you for that. And I'm sure um, there'll be opportunity, I think, at the end of this quarter for any further questions that might want to be directed to you. Um, so let's flick over to Sylvia for the next instalment. Yeah, we're just going to give you uh, a few minutes just to connect with groups of about four um, others. Uh, and uh, we um, invite you to talk about what this conversation is sparking for you. Um, there's been some really big ideas, some big challenges for what we might do, what might be some next steps, uh, and some ways that we might influence the manufacture and sale of plastic. Uh, and if you would like to reflect on how God and, and your faith might be um, informing this, that would also be cool. But uh, anyway, we'll just, um, uh, Iris is going to put you into breakout rooms. So do come back. Hello, welcome back. Uh, that was great to just uh, touch base a bit more personally. I enjoyed that. Uh, we have got, um, now we, we are kind of close to our time of finishing. And uh, so if you are tired and need to go or put some kids to bed, you are most welcome to leave. Uh, and thank you for joining us. If you've got time, uh, we, um, is that okay, Trish here, if we uh, take another 10 minutes for questions? And Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, we certainly had some great questions in our group. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll kick off with one, which is that uh, in, in uh, Russia, we work in uh, zero waste with our partner organization, um, Parakure. And I was wondering whether you had um, uh, heard a particular voice for indigenous um, people within the UN Plastics Treaty. Oh, that's such a good question. Yes, we work with Parakore as well, largely with Jackie Forbes. Mm. And um, yes, so the, the wonderful thing about this uh, mandate, it has, it has language in there for traditional knowledge and um, systems and practices. It's something we fought very hard for. It also includes just going back to the waste pickers question around informal, informal um, economies and systems. So basically that kind of it is an attempt to capture um, informal waste waste workers and waste pickers. Um, so yes, it does include that. And, and one of the co conversations we've been having around that relatedly is the need for a science policy interface, um, which is something that you know ensures that policy is informed by the the latest sound, independent, evidence based you know science. Um, and that part of that science should include indigenous knowledge 
um, practices and innovations. Uh, local knowledge as well, so citizen science um, should, in, in, you know, so citizen science and local local knowledge in place in situ over a long period of time. So um, that has definitely been a very big part of our conversation um, over the years and has mostly the last year and has culminated in the text and the mandate. Hmm. And the other question from our group is, would you be willing to, uh, if we put you on the spot and said, what were top three things that people can do? Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> yep. Um, I would say refuse. <laughs> refuse. Refuse. refuse Single-use plastics, problematic plastics. Um, I would say have conversations with as many people as you can okay. in a caring way. Um, about, oh, did you know that all plastics have, for example, um, substances of concern in them? And um, there are some concerns around plastics used for food and beverages, for example. You know, those kinds of concerned, caring, respectful um, sharing of information around plastics. Um, and another thing I would, I would say is, you know, also be vocal to those who have the most power to make the most change. Those are the three things. Um, I feel like there's a lot of, um, there's a lot, there has been for many years since the um, Be a Tidy Kiwi campaign, for example, a lot of responsibility, blame, and obligations placed on those who have very little power to change things at the scale of the plastic pollution problem. Yes, sure, we shouldn't throw our litter out the window, but really that. Even stopping that won't scale up to the, the scale of this massive escalating plastic pollution production that we don't have the power to change. So speaking to power, I think, is really important for us as well. And I jump in there and say that I, I was trolling on a website of a council and um, and they were bagging somebody for putting the wrong thing in the wrong bin. And I said, hey, flip it up. You should be selling off the people who are producing all the waste in the first place that we have to sort <laughs> spend our lives sorting. <laughs> mm. I love that. I think that's the quote of the night, actually, that we need to be vocal to those who have the most power to make the most change. I think that's an important key element of this evening. Mm. I, I was just I'll share the, the how far we got with ours with I picked Tricia's brain the fact that we've just um, New Zealand's just recently banned single use plastic of a certain type, uh, phase one, and then phase two is coming in at, at another date. Um, so we neither of us are clear. Well, I, I didn't. I thought Tricia would know <laughs> as to what that actually means, um, and if anyone else knows. Uh, for example, plastic straws. Um, when are they effectively not going to be available for sale, um, and things like that? So, look out for those things. <laughs> and um, then the other question I have that's related, um, which uh, Tricia maybe for you is I understood that New Zealand plastics had numbers on the back, back on the bottom of them and those numbers meant something and therefore you could recycle certain numbers. But I actually have heard more recently that that's rubbish, <laughs> literally. <laughs> oh, okay, so there's, so yes and no. So there is um, the idea of something that is um, theoretically recyclable and then there is actually recyclable and that can change from time to time depending on the um, um, availability of markets um, mm. the technology available um, all sorts of things so um, almost all plastics are theoretically recyclable whether they're safe to do so whether we should do that is another question um, thermosets another thing there are some plastics that really are not recyclable you can't really recycle them they just can't become brittle and fall apart but mo many many plastics you can um, this brings us into the question of who's going to be recycling it recycling it and I say that in inverted commas and where uh, we know that I've just done a, a significant piece of research on where our plastics go from Palmerston North from Papaoa post um, post consumption um, they go to Malaysia, um, a lot of PET and so forth still go to Malaysia. Um, and a lot of that, and actually PET is supposed to be, polyethylene tetraphthalate is supposed to be the most recyclable plastics, but there are still some countries like Malaysia 
that they they can't actually recycle very much of that it's not actually a very high value to them so again it depends entirely on where this thing goes and so um, we might for example sweeten a container of exported plastics with what we think is high value plastic like PET and then that will just have to be burned or buried or or or, or sent off to another developing country at lower cost because we've now contaminated the entire container load of plastics. We had, um, I think it was seven container loads of plastics we sent to Indonesia about five years ago. Um, two of them were successfully returned once they, you know, refused because they were just so contaminated they couldn't do anything with it. Um, two of them came back to New Zealand. Um, five of them went missing. Now missing could mean dumped at sea, missing could be, you know, again, exported to another developing country at lower cost where they would have to burn uh, no doubt um, their waste so we're still quite guilty of that but just going back to the recyclable thing this all plays into it this is part of the bigger, bigger sort of global systems approach to understanding what recyclable re recycling is what plastics are where it goes and how it can be responsibly managed um, Sound responsible management is also another questionable definition term that's used in the Basel Convention and needs to be clearly defined. In our room, we had a sort of questioning around is it actually, and maybe some legal eagle here can help us, is it uh, against the law to want to go to the butcher and have your you know, purchase put into your Tupperware pot rather than wrapped into plastic. Can they make you not sell you the meat because you brought your Tupperware pot and you want it in your Tupperware pot? So in um, in butchers, that's absolutely fine. It has been for a very long time. I've been doing it since about 2011. Um, that's totally fine in a variety of different butchers. The one place that I've had some difficulty is in one supermarket chain, which I probably shouldn't name. Um, and because they're quite a bit larger than the other chains, and so therefore you might guess what it is anyway, um, MPI uh, has ensured that they weren't at that, at that time anyway allowed to take, accept your own containers, unless there were a whole bunch of sort of regulations around the practice and hygiene practices around that, um, which they did in fact implement after quite a bit of pushing again from civil society. Mm -hmm. So um, so you should be able to take your container anywhere you like as long as it's clean or they sanitize it on site. Um, there should be no reason, there's no legal reason for you not to be able to do that anywhere. Uh, so yeah, that was me. <laughs> I encountered that. So yeah. yeah. COVID of course had raised some questions. Yeah. But yeah. actually, you know, for a long time, even when um, your coffee shops weren't allowing you to bring your own cups, in fact, M MPI had said, yes, you are allowed to bring your own cups, but they had made their own decision not to do that in, in some cases. So, yeah. yeah. Can I just go back to the plastic export um, yeah. query? Mm -hmm. um, just is, is there was a petition going around um, to try and get uh, exports banned yeah. from New Zealand to, mm. well, to anywhere really. Yeah. Um, where did that get to? Um, so that was with um, that, that was with somebody I was working with on, on that. And um, so I don't actually. That's a good question. I sort of left the country for a couple of months, a couple of weeks, came back, and I just forgot to pick that up again. But I will look into that again. But my understanding is that it's still sort of rotating around cabinet or you know at, at ministerial level at the moment um, and they're probably trying to figure these things out as the Basel plastics amendments are sort of being reviewed because they're quite new um, one part of the Basel plastics amendments for example is there's an incinerator working group anyway there's various working groups around this and I think that once those have kind of settled um, that might also settle a part of but that what they were asking for and this is what I would be pushing for too is there's the Basel plastics amendments and then there's the Basel ban amendment now the Basel ban amendment is exactly what you're talking about Mary and that asks for um, not OECD countries like New Zealand not to trade with not to send their waste of any description actually to non-OECD countries because we know that there's illegal waste trade if not poor waste management practices at point of receipt. So I would be absolutely pushing for that and ensuring that we have what we call the proximity principle whereby basically we create 
waste, then we deal with it in our own backyard. We don't ship it off somewhere else for them to deal, deal with elsewhere. So that petition reflected the Basel ban amendment. Um, but again, I think because the Basel ban amendment, it came to a screeching halt um, soon after there was some agreement around that because there was uncertainty about how to implement it in different countries. And I guess what I'm saying, I'm sorry, they're sort of talking around in circles and I recognise this, but I think once the Basel Plastics Amendment um, has kind of settled and the Basel Ban Amendment implementation has kind of had some more discussion, um, that's probably going to find its footing, but it's probably going to take a little bit of time. Well, this is wonderful stuff. Trisha, your brain just works so fast and you hold all <laughs> these things together. I don't know how you do it. Even it's narrow. It, I don't know about anything else. <laughs> <laughs> don't talk to you about bread. You just know about plastic. Or... No quizzes <laughs> for me. <laughs> That is extraordinary. Well, uh, on behalf of um, uh, uh, Rosha, I thank you. I thank you for all your work. And I, I, I honor all of these extraordinary networks that you're part of and these people that you hold who are absolutely at the, um, um, I haven't got the right jargon. We certainly don't talk about coal face anymore, do we? Um, <laughs> The plastic edge of uh, really living with um, the the uh, direct effects of our pollution, and it is deeply confronting uh, to our our middle class comfortable ways. And I I really hope that we as a church movement can uh, find ways to practically support. So I do invite you and also Karen and Megan. The way that Arosha works is that if any of our members uh, would like to um, invite others to participate in um, campaigns, uh, then uh, we are happy to share those uh, through our Facebook uh, or um, if there's a campaign uh, with a specific thing that way that churches can get involved, like with this um, Basel any of, uh, no, I've lost it. It's, it's gone in and out. My short ban amendment. <laughs> ban amendment. Ban, yeah. ban amendment. Right. Um, something practical like that that's timely, you know, like next week, this would be a really good person to email about this. Uh, that That's definitely something that we can promote and just to kind of keep that sort of uh, ongoing story and involvement going. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Do do um, we? I invite you to continue the conversation and to continue to feed through uh, the this um, these practical actions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also honour the the spiritual hard work of it all. Mm -hmm. I uh, do um, invite Megan to close us in another uh, reflection. So we just draw together all our thoughts and our insights and plans and thank God for our time together. Um, I'll close with a prayer written by a nine-year-old Australian pupil called Lily uh, for Plastic Free July. Dear God, grant us the power to love all of the environment around us, whether it be the vast oceans or small insects. Let us see them for the beauty they are. Open our eyes, Lord, so that we can strive to maintain our beautiful home, this earth, with less plastic and more care and awareness. Empty us of our selfishness and fill us with the awareness to care for everything around us. Grant us the hope that we can do this, that we can protect our environment and that we can protect our future. Amen. Amen. What a wise nine-year-old. That was phenomenal. Mm. <laughs> what about a bit of help? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you, everyone. And, and yeah, look forward to our paths crossing again. <laughs>